Thank you guys for attending the afternoon session. Uh, hopefully that lunch isn't sitting too heavy with everybody. Uh, so, as, uh, as mentioned, we are uh, a three-way partnership here to talk about um, IoT implementation in the oil field, specifically rapid deployment IoT, and trying to find the uh, immediate value of deploying a, uh, an IoT network in the field. So our three companies together, Aloxy, Riot, and Rigstar. Aloxy is our um, valve positioning monitor. They'll make uh, some comments there. Uh, Riot has our tank monitoring sensor, and Rigstar, we are the uh, band and hardware agnostic systems integrator. So we've got locations all across North America, uh, which together we're capable of deploying, uh, rapidly deploying um, uh, large scale LoRaWAN networks. So to start out, I mean, we've all been in a bunch of sessions. Um, our, our friends from Shell did a fabulous job of explaining what is LoRaWAN. Uh, so I don't wanna get up here and just lecture us all about, uh, about what the values of LoRaWAN are, but some top components here are uh, that the LoRaWAN is an IoT specific network, right? It's a low power wired area network. It's kind of the star of stars. Um, when, whenever I present conferences, I try to talk to my kids about it to see if, if I can get through to my kids, we'll get through to the audience. And uh, when I mentioned the Internet of Things, my kids told me that sounds like I made it up, um, which is kind of what we're doing, right? We're all here to make this up as we go along. So th the big value, of course, is cost and coverage. Uh, LoRaWAN is that much larger connectivity uh, as opposed to an LTE network. Um, and the greatest thing about LoRaWAN from our perspective today is to talk about this uh, robust and, and growing ecosystem of, uh, of LoRaWAN sensors. Michael? Yeah, so by rapidly or by uh, uh, deploying uh, the, this uh, technology LoRaWAN uh, to the field, we can actually bypass a lot of the cost uh, and complexity and bureaucracy uh, that comes with uh, traditional SCADA uh, data workflows. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you have, have seen the traditional uh, data workflow of the RTU, field communications, polling engines. Uh, so using LoRaWAN, we can actually uh, use the protocol to communicate with the gateway. Uh, and then Rick will talk about the, the backhaul, how we get it up to the cloud. Uh, we can actually bypass um, a lot of that complexity and inject either directly into SCADA uh, using uh, like an edge uh, computing technology or uh, straight into the, the data lakes, the historian, pies, uh, things like that. So what's the opportunity here? Um, as our friends at Shell mentioned, you've got to have a backhaul. And whether that backhaul is cellular or uh, a low Earth orbit satellite, or in some cases even uh, geostationary satellites, every deployment for, for LoRaWAN is going to have to have some sort of a network backhaul. Um, typically in oil and gas, those areas are largely underserviced areas. Um, they're challenging terrain, challenging environment. There's lots of infrastructure limitations. Um, from the application side, moving data across an LTE network in some of these areas is very difficult. Um, the biggest limitations we see in the field are bandwidth and capacity limitations. So LoRaWAN helps us to overcome that because we're able to take our network uh, for the sensor data off of the typical LTE network. So we're not competing with cellular traffic and voice traffic and traditional data. Um, it also allows us to connect to what would have been previously um, just economically unviable connectivity points. Gathering data from remote sites is complicated and expensive. And if we're able to do that with a network like uh, a rapidly deployed LoRaWAN network, we can prove the value right away. So our goal is here uh, to talk about immediate deployment and immediate benefits. So in most cases, we're talking lots about, um, over the last two days, about the long-term economic impact, right? We deploy a network, um, we're going to re reduce truck rolls, we're gonna reduce headcount, we're gonna increase efficiency, and we'll have some more discussion about that coming up. But the big benefits that we wanna talk about are what are the immediate benefits? What's the benefit the first day the network's out there? And if we could prove there's benefit right away, let's deploy one quickly with a rapidly deployable trailer. So that allows real-time data and intelligent monitoring right up front. Being able to bring that data in soon allows us uh, to, we'll talk about some of the use cases in a minute here, about uh, safety ca use cases and um, um, risk avoidance cases right away. So Rigstar builds networks. 
So by building these, um, th these remote networks, we remove the complexity for the client, right? Clients like Shell uh, are a great example. Um, I, as mentioned in the bio, I came from a big oil company. I understand that the, the ability to build remote networks and private networks is there. We're able to remove that complexity by building unique, robust, and remote networks um, that are proactively monitored. Uh, and, and that allows us to reduce that uh, frustration to the client because we do need a backhaul component. So with that, I'll hand off back to Michael. So when we <clears throat> talk about deploying these networks in the areas, uh, the vast uh, oil plays uh, in North America, and we've seen all of the different use cases and sensors out there, uh, we can see that the, the number of sensors are getting up into the hundreds of thousands to millions. So how do we manage this at scale? Uh, so we're gonna need uh, network monitoring, uh, network provisioning, uh, device monitoring, device provisioning, uh, a way to track battery life, uh, APIs to be able to pull the data, inject that into your systems. Uh, so it can become a, a pretty complicated uh, process. And so uh, we designed a system um, that allows for network uh, and device provisioning uh, very easily. Um, it's a, a very scalable solution. Um, and then configuration, uh, yeah, configuration uh, and updates. Um, and then we can also do that uh, over the air uh, with, with the technology as well, which is a huge benefit. Um, and then, yeah, device and, and network health monitoring. So how are these devices actually performing in the field? Are there errors? How's our network health, which uh, dramatically affects the battery life of these sensors and uh, the, the underlying economics as well? Uh, it needs to be a flexible solution. Uh, so it's deployed on Kubernetes, uh, and we have both public uh, and private cloud deployments. Uh, and then very easy uh, and documented uh, APIs, both between the LNS and the IoT Hub, uh, and also the downstream connections um, using the most industry common protocols, HTTP, Kafka, uh, MQTT, things like that. Uh, and then as far as data integrity goes, uh, we really need to know that this data is actually accurate and valid. Uh, and so by deploying a digital twin and having a historic API, we can run algorithms on the data to actually validate it and make sure that uh, things aren't going wrong over time. Uh, and then you can also alert and see where your issues are and quickly identify them and, and go out and replace sensors if needed. Uh, and then it also needs to be cost effective. Um, so with our approach, uh, a lot of our, our customers uh, already have their own data visualizations. They wanna be able to see everything in, in their platform. So, this allows them to have a single platform uh, driven by our APIs uh, to, to view everything. And then at the, at the end of the day, I mean, it's really allowing us to, uh, to Rick's point, uh, connect assets that were not viable to connect because of economic reasons in the past. Uh, so one example of the benefit of, the, of our IoT hub is our, our battery model. Um, so a lot of you may know with, with lithium ion batteries, yeah, with lithium ion batteries, uh, just measuring the voltage is problematic. Uh, you're gonna have a high battery life, high battery life until it gets to the end and it's gonna just fall off. Um, so with the IoT Hub and our historic API, um, we can actually look at real sensor data. What was the signal strength? What was the packet size? Um, how many messages is it, is it sending? And actually model that battery and predict when the end of life is going to be for that battery. Uh, and with that, you can also use that information to really optimize your network. So you can see this sensor over here uh, is, has a weak signal strength. It's using a lot of battery. Should I add a gateway here? What's that effect gonna be? How is that gonna drive my costs? So, <clears throat> excuse me, as Michael mentioned, lots of you already have some sort of a, of a visualization platform in house. Um, you're already monitoring something from the plant, SCADA data or something else. So, sorry, each of these slides automatically is advancing. Um, so uh, for smaller scale deployments or for, um, for smaller footprint deployments, and, and even in the early works, Rigstar is capable of bringing in all the sensor data uh, in a, a single dashboard before the client moves to uh, connecting everything together. Um, the other value that we bring is connecting all of the sensors, right? So we're up here with our two partners uh, of many, right? There are, as we all know, lots of sensors in the market. The, the beauty of, of the LoRaWAN Alliance is this, this open source 
uh, platform, right? So we like to tell our customers, if you can think it, we can sense it. There's always a way to find something on the market and a way to connect. And uh, our, our two partners here have very simple, easy deployable sensors. So the idea being uh, to bring all the sensors together into the one platform, and then that becomes a supplement to the existing client's SCADA network, not a replacement, but, uh, but a supplement. So now Michael's gonna talk a little bit about specifically manual valve positioning. Yeah, uh, so manual valve positioning. So according to OSHA, lockout tagout uh, is still the four, fourth most violated standard. Uh, human error accounts for 70% uh, of all accidents. Uh, we've all seen OSHA reports and, and things and the, the events that can take place from uh, a, a valve that's in the wrong position. Uh, whether it be fail failure to fully isolate um, or, or uh, open a valve, um, improper valve sequencing during tank lineups, um, or just poor communication between operators that are working on the same process, uh, not knowing what position the valves are. And that can lead to some pretty catastro catastrophic events, which we've seen in history, uh, environmental spills, explosions, uh, exposing your operators to uh, process fluids and pressures, um, and then also uh, cross product contamination uh, with tank lineups. Uh, so with a, a smart valve position sensor, you're actually able to fully close that loop uh, on lockout tagout procedures uh, and also really automate some engineering controls and put them into processes and procedures uh, that your operators can follow. Uh, so our solution for valve position monitoring, um, I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar with limit switches, um, things like that that require brackets and, and magnets and can be complicated and time consuming to install. Um, our approach is an algorithmic approach. Uh, it's based on solely the motion of the, the actual sensor. Um, and there's actually three different uh, sensing principles in the sensor, which are all used to cross check each other and validate and make the, the algorithm more robust. Um, it's class one div, div two sensor in the US. There's ATEC versions as well. Um, <clears throat> Easy to install, it works on uh, any manual valves, whether it be quarter turn, multi-turn, any orientation, uh, doesn't require any special brackets, uh, super easy to calibrate. Um, yeah, and then as far as the, the messaging, so it'll send a message on movement uh, and then also at a, a configurable heartbeat interval. So that heartbeat tells us that the sensor's alive when, when things aren't moving. A lot of these valves get moved maybe once a week, once a month, once a year. Um, so we want that sensor to check in and say, hey, I'm still here, I'm, I'm working properly, and then also on movement. And taking that approach uh, minimizes the amount of messages that we send and really extends that battery life to the five, 10 plus year mark. Uh, another application for the sensor, uh, it, it, it's the same exact hardware, uh, just a different uh, configuration on it, um, applies to emergency showers. Um, a lot of these emergency showers that we're, we're talking about are in very remote locations, um, you know, not well, well monitored. Uh, and so by connecting these to uh, data systems, uh, people can be notified immediately when these things are, are being used. Um, <clears throat> yeah, rapid response. Uh, and then also uh, reporting as well. So OSHA requires that these things be actuated and, and checked periodically. Uh, and so this creates that uh, data trail uh, to prove that you're actually following through with those applications. Oh, Jim? My next slide's up. Uh, this is one of my favorite slides. It helps me focus on what needs to happen. Uh, how do we cut through the clutter? Um, most of the show, you've talked about Laura Wan. We've talked about uh, uh, why my edge is better than your edge. What I want to focus on is this tree and IoT devices out there. And I really want to just sort of narrow it down to how do I put a thousand units in the field and not spend three years doing it? Okay, so here's our, uh, what we're trying to address is the safety, the productivity, and of course our ESG here. And if we're able to deploy immediately, many times we're on a three year plan. Well, if you deploy tomorrow, there's a lot of things we can do. In one of our oil fields, we reduced the head count by 10. So you took 10 people out of the field that possibly could get injured or, or hurt. Um, we keep people off of ladders, which is more important in some areas than the others. And in winter, it's a little tough to uh, uh, climb ladder at minus 40. Um, K 
keep the equipment working. The reason you have these chemicals in the field is they help improve your productivity and the longevity of your equipment. We obviously can reduce the carbon footprint if we aren't rolling 18 wheelers unnecessary out to a site to go inspect tanks. And of course, we do spillages both on the freeways getting here and also in the field. Okay. Now, we talked about how do you install a few thousand units, I was caught one time where someone pointed out they had the three-year plan of implementing their sensors. Obviously, that's not acceptable when you're dealing in the safety environment here. So I found a lot of sensors were taking up the three hours to install. We want to get that down to two minutes. Then it makes it a reasonable avenue to get your product installed and get safety taken care of in the field. Um, so obviously wired solutions, many times wiring up a sensor costs more than the sensor itself. So having a wireless product that can just screw in the top of the tank is a very good solution. Um, the other item is I watch people calibrate sensors. It depends on what altitude they're at. And then they have to calibrate it and figure out what fluids in the tank and what the gases are, and et cetera. Um, next item is uh, security keys. I spent half my life trying to get on someone's network. We have our own set of security keys. You don't want to be typing security keys with a guy in the middle of the field. You want the unit to show up from the factory with the keys already in there. Uh, we did a study once where every seventh keystroke is an error, and we definitely want <laughs> to not want to be doing that with uh, long security keys. Um, no custom ports drilled into the tank. You want to walk up, have the same thread pattern that's on 98% of all tanks out there, and just uh, screw your device into the top. The other nice thing is in the oil field, it's a rough environment. Having an external antenna is a nightmare. All the internal antennas are internal, just like your cell phone. There is a reason why your antennas are internal. We do it the same way so that you don't have someone breaking off antennas or a hurricane rolling through. Here's your two minute install. As I mentioned, standard tank fittings, if you look carefully, uh, we ha happen to have a white version of this thing. Uh, you can see the thread pattern. It's a MPV one inch pipe fitting or uh, bung fitting, if you would. Uh, it's battery powered. You need extended life five or more years, uh, depending how often you report. Um, and then you plug it in, walk it away. Um, you preset everything, as I mentioned, in the factory, and you keep the antennas inside and activate it. We all have cell phones. Let's use the cell phones and hit a button on the cell phone and activate the device. Of course, none of you folks out there will tell us exactly what your ROI is, but every now and then someone gets up here and uh, presents their success story and they mention that they have 100% uh, return on investment in the first year and that just happened to have been our program. So you really can get a return on your investment with this entire team here, we're showing vertical integration so that uh, uh, you can deploy these things quickly. You wanna wrap up, Rick? Sure, yeah, so as we've discussed here, the, the, uh, the goal is to find the immediate benefits. And I think we've shared a couple of use cases and I think anybody can dream up a whole bunch more, but the, the goal here is to find where is the, the value of these networks immediately, right? so that we're not waiting three to five years for an ROI. We're deploying the network quickly. And then as the network begins to grow and uh, more sensors are added to the field, we make it into a permanent network. Uh, and then that grows into, um, you know, the, as the field increases in size, we just scale up. So uh, are there any questions? Got to be at least one. Okay, here we go. Uh, how long do you run shadow manual readings after you finish installing? Um, I'll assume that is for the two of you. Uh, by the time we do installs, everything's very deterministic. As you know, most of you guys take a while to do this. Our product is well proven in the field. It's highly deterministic what we have. 
I'll take an, a stab at that answer from another direction is how long do you run a shadow manual reading? Well, if, if your process today is to run a truck to visit 10 sites in a day, um, run a dipstick, pull a reading, write it down. If we start installing um, riot tank monitoring sensors or valve positioning sensors, uh, shadow readings become a thing of the past instantly. Um, I will point out that once a company or a, a partner of ours becomes um, rely, reliant on a LoRaWAN network, the connectivity becomes the most important part of the operation. Uh, years ago, we talked about the digital oil field and reducing headcount in the oil field and uh, moving to unmanned facilities. And I think the reality is, if, if done right, we can move that way. But if done wrong, we have to increase the headcount in the oil field. The problem is now the increased headcount is people supporting networks that are not reliable, people supporting wired infrastructure that's not reliable. The goal is to build a wireless infrastructure that's robust enough that we don't have to go back. That's the trick here is, is making sure that the infrastructure is robust, reliable, and trustworthy so that once you start gathering data, it's, it's there for, uh, for, all right, so what do we have here? How do you balance configurations that affect battery life, spreading, uh, battery life, spreading factor and two-way communication? Do you wanna take that one? Let me take that. Yeah, you can take that. Okay. <laughs> Uh, spread factor is a very nice tool to have. Uh, Laura has actually set it up, so it's called ADR. It does it by itself. The, the gateway and the device talk to each other. The gateway tells us uh, what the spread factor should be. Um, and that's one of the beauties of Laura is the low, um, low power use because it optimizes power depending, depending on how close you are. Two-way communications, I would limit two-way communications to configuration stuff. Some people want to do full software updates. These are battery powered. You want to turn them on for a couple hours to get slow speed data down to your unit to update the software. It's probably not a good plan. Make sure you got good software going out there. S stick to that. Next question. The next question, does your company have international coverage or offshore applications? Um, I think the, uh, the short answer to that is, sure, why not? Um, I think all of us in this industry, uh, what is it, Richard Branson says, if somebody asks you to do it, say yes, and then figure out how to do it. So um, we have coverage, uh, our offices are based across North America, Aloxi has offices in Europe as well, um, but opportunistically, I think we would uh, be happy to ad address services anywhere. Any uh, limitations to that from the licensing well, side? Well, uh, right now we're, uh... Uh, the America centric, uh, we're certified in Argentina through Canada. Uh, moving forward, we will be uh, ATEC certified later this year. Yeah, we're EU, uh, Singapore, um, getting Brazil certification now, and then obviously uh, US as well. Uh, the next question is with only internal antennas, what kind of range do you see in the field? Do you have directional antenna models and ways to extend it? Are ways to extend it needed? That's I guess that's question. my question again. Uh, internal antennas, um, there isn't a problem. Most people don't realize the sensitivity and the reason your cell phone doesn't have an external antenna. The antenna needs to be inside for the sensitivity. And the sensitivity of your antennas are the same that we used to have in a space program back in the 60s when you have 47 foot wide antenna. They, they pick up a minus 100 dBm and people were all excited. Now we're 120, 138 dBm. You need to have your antenna inside the cabinet. So um, in fact, our customers tell us that, our favorite customers that test every sensor in a block tells us we still have the best performance. The biggest important thing you need to know how to do is tune your antenna to the device it's on. Uh, the thickness of the board will change the tuning and your distance. Uh, we can get up our birds at 10 miles in the real world. Can we put it up in a, a, a weather balloon and get 130 kilometers? Yes, but you're not gonna put that in production. So 10 miles, five miles probably in the oil field with its, this is C1D1 certified. Uh, the C1D1 guys make us do some stuff that degrades the antenna a little bit. So five miles is good there also. 
Yeah. Next question is, Riot's first slide looks like Kern River in Bakersfield. <laughs> How many tank level monitors do you have at that site? 3,000. And, and by the way, um, about half of them have passed three years running, no battery changes. And they're, they're, the batteries are half halfway through or something like that. It's a long curve, but seeing five years is going to be easy. Actual real world in production with networks going off, networks going on, and there's all, all the issues you got to deal with in the field. But yeah, I just passed 25,000 readings. Any other questions inside before we disband? I think we're getting kicked off. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.